an English language session in this um, trialing <laughs> event, which we're very happy to host here. Um, and I'm also very happy to introduce our first keynote speaker, who is Professor Henry Owen, who is a research fellow at the University of Oxford and a Professor Emerita in Portuguese and also African Studies at the University of Manchester. And we were um, very keen on inviting Hilary and I'm really delighted that she accepted our invitation to come here because we think she's one of the people, uh, one of the people who knows more about um, issues to do with gender and feminism in the Portuguese context. And lately Hilary has been publishing a lot, not just on literature, but also on film. Um, and you can see a list of her publications here. Um, and so um, I'm just going to hand over to Hilary, who will speak for more or less 15 minutes to give us time at the end for questions from the audience and a bit of debate. And the title of the keynote, as you can see in this pink um, yes, it wasn't, wasn't meant to be pink, pink that's a happy accident, <laughs> <laughs> happy gothicising accident. <laughs> it's titled Monsters, Mutants and Maternity, the Politics of the Post-Human in the Cinema, Teresa Villavid, Salvate Nordwind and the Gulfway. So please join me in welcoming the mm. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mariana. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Well, I'd like to thank all of the organizers very warmly indeed, Annabella, Elena, Filippa, Mariana, and Raquel, especially Mariana for agreeing to be my partner in crime in the new project that we're going to be working on, and very especially Filippa, who did the heroics last night, waiting for my delayed flight from Manchester until after midnight, and then turning up with tea bags and cake to welcome a tired English lady. That was sisterly solidarity, thank you, beyond the call of duty. Um, okay, so turning, turning to my paper now, the, the main motivation for this paper really is uh, this current Fundação Gulbenkian project with Mariana Leish on Portuguese women film directors. The particular inspiration for my subject matter comes from my sense that we need to get into, but also beyond, the mapping of women film director history. Certainly we need to talk in precise terms about the many women film directors in Portugal whose work is undoubtedly difficult to access and analyse in the depths they deserve. But I feel we also need to talk about women as feminist film directors engaged in politically sensitised projects that merit being read relationally in terms of fe feminist cinema de intervenção. I would like to coin that term intervenção in the broadest and most enriching sense that we can, not in any way as reductive or programmatic. The year 2017 is of course a very good place to start. It marks 10 years after the final success in 2007 of the campaign that dominated and defined Portuguese feminist politics for the latter half of the last century, the decriminalisation of abortion to take its terms uh, beyond the 1984 bill. It did so, however, at the cost of wiping the fingerprints of women's rights off its overt public image and its strategies of appeal. As most commentators and historians concur, Manuela Tavares, Rosa Monteiro, Paul Manuela, Mara Tollefson, a number of key factors permitted the change of climate that occurred between the failed referendum of 1998 and the successful one of 2007. Firstly, and very obviously, the mainstream left parties, and particularly the socialist government under Socrates uh, in 2005, began to espouse the pro-choice cause with sufficient, if not total, degrees of uniformity and determination. And secondly, a major and well-documented discursive shift occurred in the public justification for decriminalisation, away from the emphasis on women's, rights, uh, on women's choice and rights over their own bodies. A far greater focus was placed on women's health, the collective and national good, and on the disproportionate legal injustices and wide inconsistencies that blighted the actual process of law enforcement and prosecution in specific well-publicised cases. As Manuela Tavares notes in an interview for Journalí online earlier this year, o direito ao corpo não podia ser o nosso vetor principal. Foi uma evolução que as feministas fizeram no sentido de alargar suas alianças e vencer. In this process, the years immediately following the failed referendum of 1998 were particularly crucial, with considerable anger and disenchantment directed at party political socialism or some sectors of it, especially when the PSP Prime Minister, especially the then PSP Prime Minister António Guterres. 
Manuela Tavares refers to this time as mais um longo período de travessia do deserto. During this period, however, notable women artists, writers, and figures in public life and the media played a significant role in maintaining a public profile on the debate. Paula Rego, the painter, produced her famous series of abortion pastels in 1998 and 9. The second referendum of 2007 picked up the public support of women writers, Agustina Vesalwish, Lydia George, um, among the most notable. The focus of my paper today is the role played by specific women filmmakers and the landmark films they released in this desert crossing landscape that formed the transitional limbo of 1998 to 2002, before the Socialist Party took up the baton under José Socrates in 2005. Although they belonged to different generations, Teresa Villaverde, Raquel Freire and Solveig Nordland all had something specifically identifiable to say about reproductive rights and abortion during this period. Villa Verde's third and best known feature film, we've spoken about it already today, is the, is the Menos Invisible of the directors, which I think is really interesting, that double negative that we all come back to. Her best known and third feature film, The Mutants, was released on the 27th of November 1998, five months after the failed referendum of 98 on the 28th of June that year. Part of its central narrative is a clear statement about an unwanted teenage pregnancy. It's almost impossible to interpret the situation of Andrea in Usmutans independently of the debates surrounding the 98 referendum. Three years later, in 2001, one of Villa Verde's former co-workers' assistants, Raquel Freire, released her own first feature film, uh, in many ways a gothic vampire slasher movie about Queenborough University students called Rajgensu, 2001. Freire also lacked, uh, later acted as director of campaigns in 2007 for the Medicus Pelé Escolia movement, making campaign videos for them and for other pro-choice movements. And in 2002, the veteran filmmaker Solveig Nortland, Swedish-born but long established in Portugal, released an adaptation of the English writer, J.G. Ballard's science fiction story about eugenics, low-flying aircraft, called in Portuguese, Aparelho Voador, A Baixa Altitude. All three of the films I discuss here share the fact that they place at the centre of their narratives a young, pregnant woman facing a choice. All of them on close inspection include some kind of coded or cryptic comments about the abortion debate, although neither Villa Verde nor Freire ever uses that specific word as far as I can remember. And few, if any, critics have spoken about this in detail or at all about that aspect of their work. A further significant uniting factor is that all of them in different ways, but particularly Raquel Freire and Solveig Nortland, use the transnationally recognisable conventions pertaining to gothic horror and sci-fi genres. This in itself is worth our attention, as Ana Catarina Pereira has aptly noted in her pioneering book, Dar Palart uma Estética de Diferenciação. These are not at all conventional genre choices, really, in Portugal's homegrown cinema industry, and even less so for women directors. Insofar as these predominate, in many instances, over social realist techniques, they maximise the director's critical latitude and freedom of expression, universalising their strategies of appeal. They create other world scenarios that function as landscapes for exploring the possibilities opened up by the post-human condition. In her book, Representations of the Post-Human, Monsters, Aliens and Others in Popular Culture, the feminist theologian Elaine Graham draws on Rosie Bridotti to give the following timely and useful reminders about, what the historical gendering of, about the historical gendering of what we call monstrosity under the non-human. Quote, In androcentric cultures where human nature is equated with characteristics privileged as male, women and monsters are that which is other than whatever the norm may be. Monstrosity, femininity and deviance as markers of alterity, therefore, are not stable categories, but inversions of hegemonic norms. In showing forth abomination, monsters are the evidence of the crime, the symptom of the disease, the misbegotten exemplars of the fault lines by which the normal and the pathological are established. End of quote. The dialogues that my three films establish with the monstrous, the non-human and the putatively post-human afford them a, posi a position from which to critique the exclusion of specific alienated forms of embodiment, female, raced, gay or differently abled, from the false neutralities of universal humanism, 
human rights and socialist collectivism. In other words, by placing a questioning emphasis on constructions of monstrosity, deviance and the alien body, they move at many levels to reinvert the inversion of hegemonic norms, to lay bare the social and religious fault lines that have cast abortion as a crime. And in so doing, they rely on genre conventions and techniques associated with what we may call the speculative fiction-making of horror and sci-fi to afford a powerful locus of critical distanciation of alienation, embodying it, in film, embodying it in films that appear to have other major themes going on, but actually the abortion is very much in there too. And at the same time, they continue to foreground unmistakable analogues for Portugal, for Portuguese national life. Of these three films, Usmutanche is the best known and makes the most obvious use of documentary realist techniques. To recap for anyone who doesn't know it, and my apologies to the many who probably do, Villaverde's narrative centres around three alienated adolescents, the so-called mutants of the title. Their contemporary Lisbon is radically defamiliarised as Villaverde reveals a kind of city underneath, effectively turning landmarks such as the Rua Agustu on the banks of the Tagus and Rocio railway station into a new and threatening landscape. Three interlocking and fragmented children's narratives make up the film following a generally downward arc, leaving all of them in an even worse position by the end of the film. The black Cape Verdean boy Ricardo is ultimately kicked to death for a minor incident of burglary. His distraught friend Pedro finds no comfort in his dysfunctional alcoholic family. But the most dramatic and controversial element of the film, the one that always figures on the cover of the DVD, for example, involves the unhappily pregnant Andrea, played by Ana Moreira in her first major role. Failing either to find the child's father, who might be Ricardo, or to procure an abortion, she winds up giving birth in the toilets of a petrol station, then abandoning her baby. While the word abortion or termination is never spoken out loud, it is alluded to on more than one occasion in such a way as to imply that it's a kind of universal unspoken of Andrea's initially mysterious but eventually obvious situation. At one point we see her in the film hammering on the closed door of a flat, possibly still hunting for the child's father, but the scene that follows raises other explanations in retrospect. The woman in the flat below comes to find her and offers her a meal, asking as she sits down, surrounded by Catholic iconography and fado music, Acreditas em Deus? Ele pode castigar-te? This short exchange raises the possibility that the previous scene actually represented Andrea's searching out an illegal abortionist's address, only to find they have moved on. This reading is subsequently confirmed when the director of Andrea's social institution wants to move her to a more secure environment, even though he knows why she's been running away. He asks her in relation to tua condição, fizeste alguma coisa enquanto andaste lá fora? To which she replies, enquanto ia lá fora não fiz nada, está tudo na mesma. The director cynically concludes, e agora já é tarde para fazer aquilo que tu querias fazer. She's effectively locked up in Viseu, supposedly for the good of her own medical care. The coded public understanding of illegal and taboo terminations remains kind of elliptically present in the unsaids and the unnamed of all these exchanges. Standing in brutal contrast to this overt invisibility is the extreme hypervisibility of that which an anti-abortionist sector of society insists on keeping secret, the childbirth scene in the petrol station lavatory. It's here, more strongly than anywhere else in the film, that the Soviet semiotics of horror takes over Villaverde's documentary realist techniques. The screaming and the bloodshed link it in many ways to slasher subgenres of horror, as well as to the film's opening sequences, in which Andrea has predictively drawn blood already by thrusting her hand through a glass window in despair. As Carolyn Overhoff Ferreira excellently notes, the birth scene is shot using 48 images per second, with the sound desynchronized from the image, such that, quote, physical pain is extended by the slow motion. And the slow motion effect emphasizes also the exposure of the workings of film suture. In its classic definition by Kaya Silverman, drawing on Lacan, the concept of suture serves to identify the relationship between lack or loss and subjectivity in the way that film spectatorship operates, such as the film's narrative, such that the film's narrative sutures over the wound of castration. The perspective of the viewer is meant to be sutured to that of a character on screen, among other ways, by virtue of the classic shot reverse shot process, by which the gaze alternates between the characters in a verbal exchange. The viewer and the film 
thus use a range of visual, intellectual and other techniques to suture over the gaps and limitations in what they're given to see. The result there is usually to create an illusion of completeness that classic realist cinema maintains by keeping the suture invisible. But what's very specific about horror, on the other hand, is the way in which it makes the techniques of suture visible. So according to Judith Halberstam in her book Skin Shows, quote, suture precisely appears as a surface effect and the film constantly attempts to call our attention to cinematic production, its failures and excesses, end of quote. By choosing this moment to call attention to the status of her film as being cinematic production, Villa Verde embeds an important question about the social ethics of committing this extreme vulnerability to camera. And in so doing, she places the viewer at sufficient distance to become aware of their own complicity in this process. She also picks up on a theme raised earlier on about the exploitation of Pedro and Ricardo in a German paedophile porn movie. As Overhoff Ferreira and others have observed regarding the variable workings of suture in the mutants, parts of its effect derives from the fact that, quote, hardly ever is there a shot reverse shot. Point of view shots are also very few and far between, and almost never from the point of view of the three adolescents, with the result that the film's spectator text relationship is complex and unstable. The spectator is invited to shift between emotional involvement and distance. End of quote. The deployment then of slow motion and desynchronized sound here eventually gives way to an extreme close-up. That's the kind of what I would call the, one of the most arresting and shocking moments of the film. It goes on for a, a long five minutes, really, that sequence, only to then give way to an extreme close-up in a very long take. A motionless, despairing and sweat-drenched Andrea immediately after the birth with her eyes closed. Her lower eyelids, for me, evoke an almost classic sculpted Catholic image of the modest Madonna. Indeed, our perspective has been shifted from what Charles Pierce's film Semiotics would term an iconic, representative image of a young woman giving birth, to blend now with the more universally indexical register in a long still of a Catholic Madonna pose. But for this desacralized maternal goddess, the only sanctuary is the lavatory, and Villa Verde wastes no time in reminding us that this is a Portuguese toilet. It's not happening somewhere else. Throughout most of the film, indeed, Villa Verde has constructed an alienated dystopian vision of Lisbon that lies just beside and beneath the familiar city landscapes. The delinquent children are termed mutants because they bear a message of the threat about what humanity might in the future evolve into. A sinister warning. This was previously powerfully evoked with Pedro's close-up gaze to camera over the electronic voice of Arnold Schwarzenegger on a fairground game, stating, I am the future. Yet as the mother of a child for the next generation, it's clearly Andrea who is most obviously and literally the bearer of the future. And the here and now of her situation in Portugal in 1998 is, I think, strongly subliminally underlined in the scenes before and after this one. Villa Verde constantly uses background colours in the mise-en-scene that evoke the predominant red and green of the Portuguese flag, which we also repeatedly see hanging outside state institutions of care throughout the film. There are quite a few of these. There's red and green there, the flag the gratuitous traffic lights of red and green, red and green in her encounter with her mother, and so on. In the closing credits, the limitations of national progress are further brought sharply into focus, with the choice of a song that has strong historic overtones, Zeca Alfonso's Que Amor Não Me Engana. This was written in 1973, just before the revolution, obviously, and whilst Zeca Alfonso was in prison in Caxias. What ought to be a clear historical anchorage point for the film, and a milestone of change since 1974, becomes instead, in relation to Andrea's fate, a far more ambiguous marker of women's unfinished revolution. Indeed, by choosing a song that itself hangs somewhere between personal love balladry and political protest in Alfonso's oeuvre, Villa Verde encapsulates brilliantly Andrea's dual lack of political voice. As a victim who has been viciously enganada, both by love and by the historical failure of socialism for her to address her dilemma. Some of the limits and blind spots of mainstream institutionalized socialism are even more pointedly critiqued in the second of our three films, Rosgansu. 
This vampire gothic come slasher movie was the first feature film of Raquel Freire, released in 2001, three years after The Mutants. Indeed, Raquel Freire was credited on Us Mutants as having been an estagiaria de montage working with Teresa Villaverde. Freire herself, a native of Porto and a well-known LGBT activist, writer and filmmaker and a Coimbra Law graduate, uh, is also a former vice president of Coimbra's Associação Académica. The film draws its name from the famous Rosgensu, the final stage of Coimbra's student prash rituals, which entails ripping the clothing off fellow students after Kema de Svitush at the end of their studies as part of the rite of passage that signals going out into the world and the future as graduates. In this hieratic world of an ongoing Rashgansu ritual walks the mysterious dark figure of Edgar in this film, the non-elite, possibly the urban bad blood of Lisbon, not part of the intellectual oligarchy. In a single night, it seems, he seduces three women connected with Coimbra University. The finally a law student, Ana Rita, the worker at the hostel where he stays, Maria dos Anjos, and the Marquesa Dona Zita de Portugal, a psychology professor, the daughter of a long lineage of Reitorj, and the wife of a lecherous medical professor, Dr. Philippe. In the figure of Qu Edgar and the Coimbra students with their vampiric prash and their seeming passion for biting each other's necks, Freire draws together two fairly readily recognisable horror genres, that of the vampire as we might associate it with American teen college drama and that of the slasher or splatter movie. Systematically excluded from social student activities and from the possibility of study at the university, Edgar eventually responds to his humiliation by embarking on a spree of serial revenge rape and slashing. He targets five Coimbra women students and carves across their naked chests the following letters and words. AAC for Associação Académica de Coimbra, U for Universidade, Saber, Prash and Poder. And he draws his explicit inspiration from textbook legal definitions of rape, perversion, right to life, and homicidio calificado, and from the lectures given by the promiscuous law professor Carvalho e Melo. This professor significantly tells his students that o homem é um fundamento do direito, effectively erecting the cornerstone of universal humanism that will be targeted by Edgar's crimes. <coughs> As he prepares to carve his latest inscription onto the body of his fourth rape victim, Ligia, the phrase A vida é indubidavelmente o bem jurídico mais protegido do ordenamento penal português gets read out by Edgar in a voiceover of the scene. And if Edgar's masculinity as an uneducated working class man is undermined and threatened by his exclusion from Coimbra's male rituals, he is shown to be very readily able to assert it nonetheless, taking the bodies of the raped and mutilated women and the impregnated Ana Rita as the literal stakes of his overblown revenge drama. There he is dressing up as a Coimbra student in a very gothic scene with the crucifix on the wall and the mirror behind him. And that Ana Moreira again, once again in a very bloody scene, unfortunately, after her first experience of the slashing. And then you have there Poder on the body of Ophelia, the final victim, predictably enough as Ophelia winding up in the water. The vampire figure in literature and film is often, of course, feminized, queered, or at least denied all forms of legitimate social masculinity, part of a demonization that's been variously bound up at different points with anti-Semitism, class paranoia, homophobia, various kinds of moral panic historically attached to the vampire. And indeed, at one point, Edgar appears to preempt his own emasculation. He acts out a classic Coimbra romantic ideal by serenading Anna Rita on a balcony, again with Zeca Alfonso, the famous 60s song this time, Tenho barcos, tenho remos. Tenho barcos, tenho remos, tenho navios no mar. Tenho amor ali de fronte e não lhe posso chegar. Já fui mar, já fui navio, já fui chalupa a escaler. Já fui moço, já sou homem. Só me falta ser mulher. In the voice of Edgar, the gender-bending implications of this surrealist last line enhance his shape-shifting allure, they make his masking easier as they disguise his violent intentions. And yet it's clear that he most readily infiltrates Coimbra by dressing up, by taking part in a pre-existing fetishistic sexual culture of monstrosity and exploitation. As Judith Halberstam observes, quote, the genders that emerge triumphant at the gory conclusion of a splatter film are literally post-human. They punish the limits of the human body. They mark identities as always stitched, sutured, bloody at the seams, and completely beyond the limits 
and the reaches of an impotent humanism. Humanism is clearly impotent here, insofar as Edgar never seems to get caught up with by the law. Rather, his body-ripping ascent to a post-human status exposes the terms on which Queenborough's hegemonic human sexuality, straight, white, middle-class and male, gets granted, with the women and the gay man much closer to the bottom of this exclusion pile. The literalization of the prash rasgansu metaphor at the heart of this film clearly does unstitch heterosexual identities and allow new polymorphous gender realignments to emerge. However, where abortion and gay marriage remain illegal and bound up with huge institutional prejudices, the all too real bloody punishment of human body limitations is not equally borne or equally dealt out by all forms of body. To underline this, a gay male student falls victim to a vicious gay bashing as a gang hacks off his long hair during Came of this fetish. And Leonor, the partner, the lesbian partner of the president Ines, is still one of Edgar's rape and slash victims along the four stra- alongside the four straight women bent on class warfare. In the closing scene of the film, after Dona Zita de Portugal has identified the killer to the police, we see Edgar bringing red and white flowers for the Rajgansu ritual of Ana Rita as a law faculty graduate, it's red and white. She is exposed to the threat of public shame. Dona Zita implies that she's identified the father of the child, remarking, Espero que não saia ao pai. And let's have a quick look at a clip of the film, I think, because I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about the ending. Is that okay? Have we got time? I've got it queued up, if it'll come on. That's the other one. Come on in a minute. I see that, but I'll be a bit. Okay, I'm bye. Do you feel like this?
ما Okay, we have there the final questioning of the famous Quimbra Grito Académico, accompanying her rasgança, which goes, Então e para Ana não vai nada, 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 tudo, mas mesmo nada, 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 tudo. But the nada seems to ring literally true here for Ana Rita, as the kind of vessel of Edgar's revenge. The viewer's gaze is then directed from Edward's mas Edgar's masterly point of view downwards at a trapped and abject Ana Rita, a mask of gothically cascading blood-red roses and possibly what looked to me like fragments of red carnations and tears, as the camera then tracks from one corner to another of the upper quadrangle to signal Edgar's disappearance. The critic Georges Letard Ramouche has very pertinently, and I think interestingly for me, asked if Edgar really exists at all, or is he simply the bourgeois fantasy of the women who need him, what we would call in English a bit of rough. For Ramush, then, the film plays with a vertiginosa atração pelo outro, pelo que não faz parte, pelo que desestabiliza o suor e a violência, e por que não o semen e os genes, do que está em baixo, obsessão burguesa para a excelência. End of quote. The fantasy reading is a very powerful, suggestive one, for sure, but for me it might work a bit more consistently if Ana Rita had any real choice but to accept o semen e os genes. The abortion and gay bashing issues raised here are, I think, what ground this film so brilliantly in a lived political domain, where freedom of sexual fantasy, such as that that Ramos outlines, cannot simply be acted out by everyone at equal risk. For slash movies in particular, as Judith Halberstam argues, the actual fragility of skin itself precisely emblematizes the unstable boundary between representation and reality, the very boundary that horror plays with. And so it disrupts the usually expected safe relations between them, between representation and reality. Under the surface of Anna's skin, exposed to the public with her rajgansu at the end, is the monster demon child of the rapist Edgar that she will have to bear into the future. Attacks upon skin in slasher movies draw attention to the skin's function as pure surface, and then to the relation of surface to depth, or to the chaos and disruption that lies beneath it. Through the persistently literalized ripping of skins, not of outer capes and garments, Rajgazu becomes not only a film about the embodiment of gender, but also, of course, metacinematically, a film about cinema itself, where skin functions as a kind of membrane or screen, a bringing to the light through critical use of horror and its exposure of suturing, that which is normally forced to remain hidden beneath the surface. The third and last film I want to look at turns this process on its head in a way. It insists on bringing the taboo topic of abortion aggressively into the open in a boldly science fiction context. The time and the place are ostensibly not Portugal and not the present. A Prelio Voador a Baixa Altitude from 2002 is based on a science fiction adapting the English short story entitled Low Flying Aircraft that was written in 1976 by J.G. Ballard, who's much better known even in the English context for Empire of the Sun, but he was actually an amazing sci-fi writer too, as well as a single father of three children, which I think plays out very relevantly in this film actually. It's a film about fatherhood too. As a Portuguese and Swedish co-production, this was directed by the Swedish-born but largely Portuguese filmmaking veteran Solvig Nortland. Set in the future, 30 years on from when it was written in 76, Ballard's original story was located in the real Spanish Costa Brava resort of Ampuria Brava, cast here as a decadent and decaying resort at the end of time and space. As many critics have observed, one of the most strikingly successful aspects of Nordland's brilliant visual design here was her use of the purpose-built but soon-to-be-abandoned 50s Portuguese seaside resort, Troia near Setúbal. This was actually used in its final days before being blown up, adding a certain kind of strength to that finalness of that uh, wind-blown resort on the, on the coast. In Nortland's film, it's a liminal nowhere land by the sea, a hotel inhabited by a cask of elderly international grotesques, creating a kind of globalised pre-apocalypse. As I said to Abiel Conference in England last week, that feels a bit like Brexit's waiting room if you're British. <laughs> so... <laughs> Best not to watch it with that in mind, but couldn't have been known in 2002. The main topic discussed in the resort at the end of the universe is that populations are declining to the point of countries being non-viable. As we're told, Suecia já não funciona. 
Babies, designated by the acronym ZOT, Z-O-T-E, are constantly being born with physical abnormalities, exposed optic nerves and deformed genitalia. They are thus routinely aborted in increasingly huge numbers, causing demographic meltdown. In the original Ballard work, a heavily pregnant Judith and her husband come to Ampuria Brava, hoping after six prior abortions to finally produce a normal child, under the tutelage of the mysterious Dr. Gould, who has the medical care of Judith. But Gould also undertakes unexplained journeys in an old turboprop crop spraying plane, the low-flying aircraft, or Aparelu Vodor of the title. The couple's experience fleeing to the hotel is framed by a climate of fear, clandestinity and militarised police persecution. It's all too recognisable from the ongoing abortion struggles of the early 2000s. Just as Raquel Freire borrowed and repurposed classic pro-life icons such as fetuses in jars, Nordland's film also makes constant use of posted slogans such as Ecreditamus no Futuru and This Is Us alongside ide idealistically Aryan looking babies. The abortion issue is addressed here counterfactually insofar as forced terminations are being used to illuminate the question of choice. So the question of choice is still there, but in the inverse direction. Many of the film's dominant images effectively play in both directions. At one point, Judith has a nightmare of an agonizing birth strapped into a chair, an image of extreme institutional control that looks very like a lot of Paolo Rego's abortion uh, pastel series. And in an earlier sequence, in the film's opening, a nameless pregnant woman is on the run from three armed policemen and a helicopter, like something out of The Handmaid's Tale that we've already mentioned this morning. This evokes a recurrent fear for women forced to get across national borders undetected when travel or backstreet were the only options. Indeed, in 2004, only two years after this film was made, Paulo Portos, as the defence minister, ordered the Navy to fire on the Dutch abortion clinic boat Women on Waves when it entered Portuguese waters. How recognisable here are the Portuguese reference in the film, amidst this clearly transnationalised allegory of doom from an English source? Well, certainly Ballard's original name for Dr Gould is kept in English, and other European languages appear, but the predominant language, of course, is Portuguese. And interestingly, the central husband and wife characters do have Portuguese spelled and pronounced names here, even though it involves changing them. Judith and André replace Judith and Richard. The film adaptation remains largely truthful to Ballard's central premise. The Forrester couple finally realise the aborted Zot babies are in fact the next phase of human evolution. However, where Ballard focuses primarily on the decisive agency of the two men, Forrester and Gould, Nordland's adaptation, as Anna Caterina Pereira has explored in, in great depth and very fruitfully, Nordland gives Judith the dominant perspective and makes birth a woman's choice. She also makes Judith aware of the Zot's evolutionary significance through her interaction with another woman, Carmen, who turns out to be Gould's daughter, a Zot kept secretly alive. Carmen appears as an exotically beautiful nocturnal ghost, wandering the hotel in dark glasses, her presence marked by strange electronic music, green signs and blue lighting. She can only discern objects and directions with the help of luminous green paint traces left for her to follow on walls and open Im images and spaces. Her influence on Judith grows as if Carmen was somehow controlling the unborn child. Beset by unexplained physical symptoms, Judith fears her child is a monstru, yet she's drawn into Carmen's sphere of influence and overcomes her husband's pessimism, finally ensuring that the Zot child, Elias, will be given over to Carmen's care, the only person equipped to ensure he can live in the new coming world of the future. As Gould tells them, Zots can only live together in groups, so he is actually using his Aprelio Voadora Baixa Altitude to paint the world itself in the green luminous colour that they can see and navigate by, so that the Zots will actually replace the current human race on the edge of extinction. Far from being then a monstrous non-human destined for extermination, the child becomes a post-human guarantor of survival through the fact of his connectedness with other beings who relate similarly to him to the maternal and technological world. Parenting a living child in this context is somehow posited as being necessarily both social and natal, in a move which I think cleverly sidesteps and decenters the bioessentializing of women, at the same time as it does acknowledge the specificity of women's role in giving birth. In this context, perhaps Elias is in fact destined to be, following Rosie Bridotti's description of Dolly, the clone sheep, the first of a new gender, beyond the dichotomies of the patriarchal kinship system altogether. 
This is certainly hinted at in the scene where Judith and André discuss the child's name, whiling away their time in the ruined chapel. They decide André is prompting on his grandfather's name, Elias, the Old Testament prophet. Yet as they do so, the camera pans to the space where the image of a divine figure or prophet of the future ought once to have been in the chapel's altarpiece. The patriarchal Christian backcloth to André's traditional patrilinear decision has been lost here or even consciously excised. There's only an outline, an ending, a vanishing point, a space to be rewritten or repainted in the future. Judith, meanwhile, states that she knows without seeing a scan that her child is a boy, already acquiring the mysterious visionary powers possessed by Carmen. Where the shift in the planet's future is to nurture rather than natalism, there's a corresponding shift of alignment in the relations of new humans, such as Carmen and Elias, with technology, science and the material world. In this respect, both Nortland and Ballard pin their techno-utopian vision of planetary survival in the face of environmental and demographic meltdown on the idea that closely resembles uh, a quintessentially post-human figure, the cyborg. The cyborg was famously coined for feminist theory in the 80s by Donna Haraway in Manifesto for Cyborgs, Science, Technology and Socialist Feminism in the 80s, which first appeared in 85 in Socialist Review. Haraway's cyborg metaphor for postmodern feminist subjectivity refers, quote, to a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, a creature of social reality as well as a creature of fiction, and end of quote. Read then as a fairly clear cyborgian challenge to the boundary between social reality and fiction, Nordland's Carmen accurately transposes that description in Ballard, whereby, as Gould tells us, Carmen has a huge collection of watches with luminous dials, hundreds of them, that she's been filching for years from shops. She's got them all working together, but at different times. It's some sort of gigantic computer. God only knows what overlit world nature's preparing her for, but I suppose we shan't be around to see it. Indeed, Carmen never appears independently of her supporting technologies, her dark glasses, her three watches, her guiding ciphers. When the couple eventually hand their child over to Carmen, Judith tells her husband, and as Carmen takes the child out into a fading of light, we see André remove his watch, on which the alarm has just sounded for the end of our civilization, placing it next to the luminous map of signs that belongs to Carmen. Have we got time to do a short clip of this one as well? Are we all right or are we running a bit too close? It is short, yeah, <laughs> okay. Then there's only one paragraph to go, I promise. So there's not a great deal after it. Oh. the final extreme long distance shot turns its perspective over the earth into that of a globe with green ciphers like signs on a digital screen. Gould's name of course contains the letters in English that spell God yet he remains a resolutely post-divine human in his post-human quest. As Haraway reminds us quote no objects spaces or bodies are sacred in themselves any component can be interfaced with any other if the proper code can be constructed for processing signals in common language. This is a film all about, I think, reproductivity in common language and social survival. The 
post-human vision in this film lies in the shifting of social beliefs and possibilities to accommodate newly evolved bodily, bodily experiences, such as Carmen's and the child's altered vision, a radical redisposing of multiple bodies and sensory capacities, affective ties, social relations, and interface with the material and technological worlds and environment. This social vision of a changed post-humanity that is no longer monstrous does not deny women's role in birthing, but it refuses a natalist ontology of human survival that is wholly reduced to that. As such, I think it affords a valuable and pragmatic counterfactual proposal in the quest to carry the abortion struggle forward beyond a manichaeistic discourse of women's rights versus rights of the child. If anything is shared then by my three films beyond their focus on abortion issues and their very astute deployment of speculative and fantasy genres, it is this emphasis on a collectivised social responsibility for the reproductive politics of the nation as a whole. Usmutantz asks how can it be good for the nation as a whole for frightened girls to give solitary birth in gas stations, generating only the next abandoned cycle of care system children. Rajgansu questions the moral social value of a deceased woman giving birth to a child engendered by a psychotic rapist slasher using women to avenge class discrimination. Nortland shifts the entire abortion frame of debate away from bioessentialist natalism towards a more broadly conceptualized social parenting as part of an interface for new environments and technologies. If Haraway's post-human cyborg in the mid-80s was seeking to be, as she put it, faithful to feminism, socialism and materialism, women filmmakers in late 90s Portugal, or some of them that I've looked at today, were clearly also drawing strategically and in interrelated ways on the positive potential and unleashed by the post-human and the cyborgian image. Making a contingent cinema de intervenção then, out of these recuperations and revisions of the monster, they hold the pathologizing and the criminalizing of the female body up to the light of these speculative genres as a way of exposing the historical fault lines behind it. And they also hold the social anti -abortion, socialist anti-abortion lobbies of 1998 to account too for allowing those fault lines to be perpetuated. Thank you. long, wasn't it? Fifteen minutes? Ten minutes? Ten minutes, ten minutes, ten minutes question. Um, maybe I'll give you a question. Yeah, just it's something I, I was thinking while you were speaking, but obviously you have to think of something there. Um, question. I mean, this is fascinating speech uh, and your talk. <laughs> you were talking about the question as being something about limits, and I think mm. you expressed really Yes, I mean, I think they're reframing a very particular time in history and they are reframing it differently. I mean, none of them use the kind of 1974 or the classic kind of revolutions, Echo Alfonso Adriana Correra de Oliveira songs in a way that gives them their original context. All of them are being used to move you beyond that historical marker. So they're both historical markers and they are very clearly not. So to me, these are all songs for women of the unfinished revolution. So that's a limit that hasn't occurred for women. They're going on into a sort of limitless nightmare where that has not yet been bounded as a limit. And that's quite important. Uh, the sound plays very differently in Solveig Nordland, and I haven't talked about that because I think it would be a whole other paper, but she does an awful lot with sort of classic European classical music. There's things like Vivaldi's Four Seasons and there's lots of tacky strouts for the inhabitants of the hotel. And that, I think, is, is a generalised idea of the end of civilization. that she's not using very specific... Not any that I've recognised, anyway, no very specific Portuguese sound markers. There are, there are other ways that you can track that to being a Portuguese film. She does, at the very end, that music is the song sung by the, the character that you see, the old woman in the wheelchair watching them drive away, who is implied to be Carmen's mother. 
possibly, or Carmen's grandmother. She's implied to be related to that family, and she gets to sing that almost lullaby-like song. It's a kind of a lament for the end of a civilization. So that song gets picked up as the closing theme. And I think it's written for that film. I don't think she's taken any kind of reference, as far as I know, any reference from a known piece of music. But yeah, songs are about making you draw the limits elsewhere as to where women are in relation to socialist history. It's ironizing as well, a lot of that Marxist discourse of fertility and burgeoning and recreation and semi-andal, pointing out that real people pay the price for that if it's constantly reproducing a revolution through sexuality and through semi-andal. Then it has very real repercussions and consequences. So I think the songs are very ironized when they're from that era. Uh, and he's picking up, imitating the Queen Brafard and singing, isn't he really, singing on the balconies. And I think that the post-human gets used as a way of kind of She's using the post-human to, to critique how we define the human, who gets to, to be human and who doesn't, and that's a classic way to use the post-human, isn't it? But brilliantly used. Does that sort of yeah, yeah. pick it up a bit for you? <laughs> You're Anna Katarina, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, I loved your book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> special logic to talk about it. I think it's almost unavoidable in them. The first time I watched The Mutants, I couldn't believe that it hadn't really been talked about, because to me, and having lived through 1998, I remember the referendum of 98, I remember every reasonable woman I knew was here was furious in 1998, and I just remembered that as a very real time, and it just leapt off the screen at me teaching this to my undergraduates at Manchester. Hang on a minute, this is an abortion film. At one level, of course it is, as well as all the other things. So that one, I couldn't avoid it, and, it, and then it struck me as, as very, very strongly present in British Council too, when you begin to look at what happens at the end. It's less obvious in Solvig Nortland, but I think it's quite interesting that she does pick that particular, She, as you know and as you've written brilliantly in your own book, she, well, she changes very much what Ballard does, actually. She goes quite a long way from Ballard, really. It's very, very much developed from what he does, and I felt there had to be some kind of motivation for that around women's body politics. I wondered if, you know, at one level, lots of critics don't read these as abortion films at all, and I think that's because they have embedded the issue in things that appear to be about something else. So they are encoded in films that appear to have a, a, you know, a perfectly clear reading that is alternative to that. You can read them without referring to it, but to me that is to miss an awful lot and to miss an awful lot of their logic to read them without reference to women's body politics. And this is a question I would throw out as well, really, to anyone else who's thought about this. I wonder if there was a tendency then, I think there was certainly a need to speak about these issues to socialist politics, to the right-thinking left. It's not that I tackle the church or the right, I tackle the left in these films. They tackle the socialists who didn't get it, not the church who were never going to get it, but the socialists who didn't you know, get tackled in this film. And I, I wondered if there was a desire to use fiction film rather than documentary as well, because there is such a history of not being able to disguise it at all in a documentary. You can't wrap it up as something else. And there's been a strong tendency, you know, I remember years ago interviewing Maria Antonia Pala back in the 90s, you know, and she was certainly somebody who suffered horrendously for making a documentary about this. And I felt there was a very, very interesting and skillful move to draw on fiction film 
to talk about this in a very creative, imaginative way, in a psychologically searing way that wouldn't be quite so obviously and so heavily risky as documentaries have to be. And to me, these films just leapt out at me as, as not saying identical things about it, but all of them clearly feeling that abortion was the issue of the day that had to somehow be embedded into those films to have something political to say about women. And I think there's quite a lot of women's literature as well that could be reread in that light that isn't principally about abortion, but actually does have quite a lot to say about it when you dig under the surface. So, you know, I think, yes, they, they do strike me as all of them wanting to say something about reproductive politics at that time, even if they could be perfectly well read as not being about that, and often are. <laughs> that's their strength. I think that's what they're trying to do. They've got an alibi, a good alibi, but not not as 100% as, as some might think. <laughs> Thank you. Obrigada, eu. Obrigada pelo filme. Não. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting admission that the men they're normalizing you to write using their cameras like a penis. So, I mean, it's got. <laughs> It's got an interesting ramification, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I mentioned, yeah, Paulo Portas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm. I bet they did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. No. That's what I mean. That's interesting. Mm. No. That was going to that's what I was going to ask really, if I've missed anyone who does talk about it. Or in Villa Verde either actually. Mm. You're welcome. That are yes, that are moments of intervention importantissimas. Thank you. Well, I think on the extremely positive note, we should end because um, we have a short bit of different things this morning. As you know, after the final session, we are moving to the table for the round table on women in Portuguese film. So, this is Jeremy, thank you very much again for the wonderful.